I'm an alcoholic. So, we've hypothetically we've written this inventory. We've done the very best we can. We followed the procedure in the book. I'm starting to see how wrong I'd been about so much. I'm, I'm humbled by my mistakes and my misperceptions of people and. Um, I've, this has all come to head in the fifth step with my sponsor, hopefully. And now I'm sent home. And the book gives us directions where we, we go home, we say a couple prayers, we look back over the inventory process. I ask God uh, if I've omitted anything from one of the prayer, one of the two prayers, I've omitted anything from trying to build a new foundation in my life. Uh, and if I have, I, if something pops up, I go take care of it with my sponsor immediately. And then I come to step six on top of page 76. And I think step six is, is often, for me anyway, I can only speak for myself, and I can kind of speak from the experience of the guys I sponsor over the years, is that step six is, is often overlooked. It's often misunderstood. One of the guys I sponsor calls it the Judas step because if you're sober 25 years and something is betrayed, and one of the 12 has betrayed you, it's usually six, right? Because it's easy to placate and hard to do. We became entirely ready. What's entirely ready? I mean, entirely ready. You know, when Wilson first wrote it, he used the word willing, and then he changed it to ready. Entirely willing. Um, here's what I did. I finished my fifth step after the first good inventory I did it, a little over four years sober. And I, I, I went... I went home and I said the seventh step prayer in the middle of page 76. And then I started to make some amends. Almost as if entirely ready. Yeah, 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 I'm sure. Of course I am. I wasn't. I didn't even know what entirely ready looked like, truthfully. Uh, what, I, I was entirely ready to not get in trouble anymore. I was entirely ready not to be depressed. I was entirely ready not to be full of anxiety. I was entirely ready to hone myself to such a state of spiritual perfection that people would want to touch the hem of my garment. Um, but I wasn't entirely ready to give up some of these things that I have been depending on for years for security. They've been some some of this. Uh, these things are in it. There, it's funny that does they don't they don't present themselves as defensive defense mechanisms, but in actuality, they're defense mechanisms against a life that I'm afraid is going to be lonely, boring. No, a life of 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 a life of uh, no abundance, a life of of uh, squalor, a life of you know, all the things that I do, a life where nobody approves of me, like, you know, on and on. I defend myself with dishonesty is, is often a defense mechanism against the things I'm afraid of. Um, lust is a defense mechanism against loneliness and against the fear of never being valid and, and hooking up. And, and, and a lot of guys, I, I've had this conversation with a lot of guys, a lot of guys will, will settle. Uh, they, they have this desperate need to be hooked up, and they don't know how to be intimate, so they settle for sex because it's as close as they can get because they don't know how to do the other thing, right? Because the other thing involves a lot of other-centeredness. And what does that look like when you've been self-centered all your life, right? Um, so it's a defense mechanism. Anger is it in rage and violence. That's all defense mechanism when I'm threatened. 
you know, my God, what if God, what if God removed all this stuff? What if he took away my anger? Then the next time somebody's trying to take advantage of me and roll over me and punk me out, who's, who's going to stand up for me if I can't throw a little, if I can't get a little angst up and a little rage? Who's going to protect me? You know what the old timers will say? Oh, God will. Yeah, I'm not so sure. Would he really? When I, would he really? How, how many people here have guns in their house? I do. How many? Yeah. So, wh what are we afraid of? I mean, we are, aren't we? I mean, is the, I mean, would you, unless you're just like to, like metal and you just like to get them out every once in a while and shine them. I mean, <laughs> what, what are we afraid of? And, and that doesn't make make us bad people. I'm not. A, I'm not a, an anti. I'm not. A, I have no. I have no dog in that fight. I have guns because my my grandfather was an NRA guy, and I just grew up shooting. I just I, as part of my childhood. I'm not pro or against. I, I have guns. I like guns. Uh, but I got to be honest with myself. I have them because there's an element of fear there, right? Uh, so what if God really did take them away? And so what happened to me is I I don't say the six step prayer. I I don't to be looking back honestly. I don't even know. I don't know if I even saw it, or maybe I conveniently didn't see it. I don't know, but I didn't say it regardless. And there is a six-step prayer, and it's at the, the, the end of the first paragraph on page 76. It says, if, if we still cling to something, we will not let go. We ask God to help us to be willing. So I said the seven-step prayer, and I went about the business of... Suppre of I, went up the, I went about the business of armed with the information and the knowledge from step four and step five, I went about the business of self-improvement. I went about the business of, of beating my defects of character into submission. I went about the business of uh, suppressing them. And the problem with that is, is that there's a law of physics that applies to the realm of the spirit and in the law of physics is for every action there's an opposite and equal reaction whatever i suppress it seems to gain torque and then it busts out eventually there's wilson talks about this on page 101 this i this is a very uh pretty very accurate description of me trying to fix myself by self will and it's in the, the second full paragraph. Now, he's talking, he's, he's talking about alcoholism. Now, here's my take on alcoholism. Alcoholism is everything I'm up against once you take the alcohol away, right? Alcoholism is what I come to AA for. It's what I work the steps for. If I, didn't, if I just had an alcohol problem and didn't have alcoholism, I wouldn't need AA. I'd just quit drinking. But I come to Alcoholics Anonymous for alcoholism. And here's what Bill says. He says, in our belief, any scheme of combating alcoholism which proposes to shield the sick man from temptation is doomed to failure. If the alcoholic tries to shield himself, he may succeed for a time. But he usually winds up with a bigger explosion than ever. We have tried these methods. These attempts to do the impossible have always failed see lack of power really truly is my dilemma I, I don't I, ha, I can suppress this stuff for a little bit but I can't I don't have the power to continue to do it and I do it, it it's like they gain torque and I have a bigger explosion uh, one of the things I'll give you an example of, of how what happens with self-will one of the things that you know, now you got to remember, I took this this particular fourth and fifth step with over four years sober, so I had a lot of names on my resentment list of people in AA, because I notice things about you. You know, I'm just good at that. You know, and, and um, so I have a lot of resentments, and and 
what became overwhelming to me after my fifth step and during my fifth step is it, I was so uh, so disgusted with myself that I was that judgmental, that I was that petty, that I wanted to mind everybody else's business. Uh, and I just, I, I looked at, you know, when you just do it once in a while, but when you do it for years and then you have a list of people you've been judgmental about like that, and you've taken their inventory, and sometimes I'm taking their inventory and I don't even know anything about them. I'm just imagining stuff to make, to grandize me and puff me up to feel smugly superior. And I was just, I was horrified at how judgmental I was. And so I made up my mind. I said, man, I, I can't, I'm not having it. I am not going to be judgmental anymore. That, this is disgusting. I am not going to be judgmental. And I almost instantly started to notice the judgmental people in AA. <laughs> I'm judging the judgmental, which makes me exactly like them, for God's sakes. I'm intolerant of the intolerant. I'm, not only now, now, I've take, now I can take it to a global level of, of crusade, you know. I'm, I'm going to clean up AA of the judgmental people. Well, you might as well just nuke AA, because that's the way we are. I mean, you know. Uh, oh, geez. If you ever go to a kid's arcade... There's a thing in there called whack-a-mole, and it's very, it's like that. You, 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 you suppress, you willfully suppress something down, it pops up somewhere else. I had the same thing with gambling. I, I hit this a horrible bottom with gambling in about a year and a half sober. I was suicidal. I'd never gambled till I got sober, because I ain't gambling away no potential drinking money. You know, it ain't going to happen. But I got sober, and I'm not drinking. And I started, I started just screwing around with a little bit, hit a couple big jackpots. Bad, that's a bad thing. Looks like a good thing. It's a bad thing. Looks like a, it's a bad thing. And I got hooked into that. And at a year and a half sober, I'm, I'm Friday night. I just got paid that day. I'm coming out of the, uh, uh, the Jolly Trolley up on Sahara in the Strip. It's about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'm broke. And my rent's due. My part of the utilities are due. Now I don't have any money for, for food or gas or cigarettes or anything for the rest of the week. And I, because of my gambling, I have borrowed money from about everybody I can borrow money from. And I'm sitting in that parking lot, and I hit this bottom. I just, I wished I was dead. I couldn't do this any. I just, I hated myself. I'm pounding my fist on the steering wheel and the dashboard, and I'm cussing myself. You worthless piece of crap. I'm cussing myself. And I am in a, I'm in a trap I can't spring. I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to have to go to people and beg and beg and borrow, and I don't know what I'm going to do. And that was, I hit this bottom. I went to a few GA meetings. I, I went and identified a little bit. But I'm such a, I'm like a wimp in GA, really. Um, so what I did is I found... I, to my amazement, I found that there was probably more recovery from abstinence and more abstinence, successful abstinence from gambling in AA than there was in GA in Las Vegas at that time. And I had a whole bunch of guys I networked with that didn't, that used to gamble, didn't gamble, and I talked to them, and I, I worked the steps with it, and I, and I got free from it. And I was free from it for uh, 20... 20, almost 25 years, I guess. And then, then something happened. And uh, I sold my company. And I ended up with a whole bunch of cash, a lot of money, a lot of money. And my head, the voice in my head, not the good voice, the voice I should know better than to listen to, but it's such a reasonable and seductive voice. It says to me, well, you need... You need to invest that money, Bob. And there's a the, the good voice is trying to say, no, wait a minute, that's like you know, the stock market's like gambling. You can't do that. And the bad voice, it's it is not gambling. It's investing. And I started off just a little simple, meager thing. I bought a you know a little bit of put some money in a 
a stock account, bought a few stocks, and kind of got a little rush from that, made a little money, put a little more money in that account, bought a little more stocks, and a little more, and a little more, and uh, it started to consume my life. And at one point, I was on the computer probably six or eight hours a day. If you were a guy sponsored and we were going somewhere together, you ended up listening to Bloomberg on the radio because that's all I listen to anymore. I read uh, probably eight or ten uh, market reports and, and newsletters every day. And at one point, I started to get really sick. I, I, was, I had a million dollars on margin. Now, if you don't know what that is, you're, you're playing on their money. It's not your money. And a big sink in the market, and they can take everything, take your house, they can take everything you got. And when you're playing on a, on a margin account, and you got a million of your own in there, and you got a million of theirs, you can have half million dollar shifts in your net worth in one day. This will keep you up nights. And it's crazy. And I'm getting sicker and sicker. And I'm, I'm, tell, I'm having these battles with myself. I, could, I should stop this. I mean, what if the market crashes? I could lose everything I got. And I'm scared. But I can't stop. I intend to stop. It's like drinking. How many times we sit in those bars saying, I've got to quit this. I have to quit this. I can't stop. The minute my eyes pop open at 6 a.m. because the market opens at 6.30 in Vegas, which is... 9.30 in New York, and I'm at that, I'm at that computer at 6 a.m. every morning. I can't, I'm, I, I'm as helpless as I was with drinking. And then what happened is I'm on, <clears throat> I'm at, sitting at the computer one morning, and I'm, I'm, I've become a day trader now, and I'm trading. I'm try, every day I, I sell a dozen or two things and buy a dozen or two things. and uh, I'm on the phone, and I'm mean, on, the, on the computer, and, the, and my phone rings. And it's a guy's sponsor, and he's going through a divorce, and he's, he's in a lot of trouble. And I got the phone here. And I'm, uh-huh, 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 uh-huh. And he, he hears the keys on the computer. And he says, what's that noise? Uh, 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 nothing, nothing. He said, that's, a com that's, com that's keys on a computer. You're, are, are you trading stocks? <clears throat> no, it's, I felt like I threw a bucket of water on me. I said, no, 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 I'm just, I'm just looking at something. He said, you're trading stocks. You're not even listening to me, are you? No, no, I'm listening to you. He said, what did I just say? Oh, I was busted. <laughs> and here's a man who's called me for help. And I'm so obsessed with m m the stuff I'm obsessed with that I am absolutely useless to him. Useless. I got so much of me and my stuff going on with the stock market, I don't even, I'm not even listening to him. And I was ashamed of myself. I really, really felt bad because I, I've always loved Alcoholics Anonymous, and I, and I knew that I was, be, I was being a very, very bad example of AA. And so I started asking God every morning and every night and sometimes throughout the day to please take this off me, get me free of this, take this obsession with this trading away from me. And nothing happened. But I persisted. Someone told me, that you have to do this for a while. And I persisted. I'm telling you, I think it took close to six months of talking about it with friends of mine and praying about it multiple times a day and I remember the day, the same thing happened with cigarettes and tobacco. The same thing happened with sugar. The same thing happened with, with, with gossip. And then, then it came back again, like the gambling came back in stocks. And um, I woke up one morning and something had shifted inside me. And I just went to the computer. I didn't look to see how the market was doing. I just went there and sold everything. And haven't been back. And it took a while. And God did that. Why did it take so long? Well, God's slow, but he's very old. He's old. Uh, he, he just, <laughs> I mean, he's slow. Uh, 
and and the same thing. I, I was five or six months asking for the desire not to smoke before I got up one morning and didn't put light the first cigarette. It's been that way for everything for me. And I started thinking about what does this mean? What do, when the, in the sixth step, what is became and we became entirely willing or entirely ready. What's that? What does that mean? And in the 12 steps and 12 traditions, it talks about why none of us are rendered white as snow, why God doesn't remove all our defects of character. And then it, it, it sort of answers the question by saying, well, it's mostly because we don't hit the same kind of bottom with these things that we hit with drinking, right? And then I thought, well, why not? I, I've known people, I, I've known people that have committed suicide as a result of gambling. Sober, sober alcoholics that switched from that to drinking to. And then I thought, well, what's it look like to be, what would it look like to be entirely willing or entirely ready? When I got sober, I'd been relapsing uh, for many years. And the big difference in 1978 to all the other years I tried to get sober is that all the other years I tried to get sober, I talked like someone who was willing to go to any lengths. I talked like a guy who really wanted to be sober. But my actions, not so much. In 1978, I was nuts. But if you'd have watched me, you'd have seen a guy going to two to three meetings a day. You'd have seen a guy calling his sponsor. You'd seen a guy taking meetings into the care unit, into Reality House, into the Samaritan House. You'd have seen a guy who was trying to make amends and pay people back. You'd have seen a guy who was praying. You would have seen a guy that if nothing else, his actions would have demonstrated a guy who was evidently entirely willing. And so I started to understand that if I can position myself in life towards the thing that's objectionable, that's killing me, with the same demonstration of willingness I did when I, was, when I got sober, that God will do something. But I have to do that. And, and, and that's not always the case because there are examples in AA where somebody hits a little bottom with something, they just say, God, take it, and it's gone. Well, good for you. <laughs> I hate you. <laughs> no, I don't. And, and, and some things are like that, and some things are like that. Um, but, but not always, because sometimes the, 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 the illusion of security or fun or gratification that's attached to some of this stuff, sometimes the tendrils of that stuff go deep within us. And they don't, they don't let go and, and come out easy. So am I willing to persist? It's hard on people with short attention span to persist. But I'll tell you what, I know this, I know this 100%. I know that anything I'm willing to take to God with the same persistence and consistency that I did when I first got sober with drinking, I know that he can remove it, and he will. I've done it with a lot of things. I, my, the last thing I did it with was I, was, I got addicted to diet soda, which I know is horrible. And I don't just... I wasn't just addicted to like what most people are addicted to, Diet Coke. Oh, no. No. I went for the crack cocaine of diet soda, Pepsi Max, right? <laughs> I, I, want, I want the twice the caffeine. You know, I, I'm go, for, I go for that, right? And, and I couldn't stop. And I was drinking six or eight of those 20-ounce bottles a day. <sighs> yeah, I know. I know. What am I? I am an idiot sometimes. And I just started asking God every day, every day, every day, and every day. And one day I just, I'm done. I haven't had one in quite some time. <sighs> Am I willing? Am I willing? There's an old adage, without him, I can't, evidently. But without me, he won't. He won't. I have to show up and present myself through my actions in such a way to catch the grace. I often think that, that AA is often like how you work a sailboat. Uh, I remember when I was a kid, I, I, that school I got sent away to for disciplinary things upstate New York was on one of the Finger Lakes. 
and there was the next right next to the school was a, a was a, a little resort thing and they had sailboats and once in a while with the teachers and stuff they'd let us take one out you know a sailboat on this lake well me and a, a friend of mine are drinking wine and smoking pot and we knew that we were sailors and we stole one of the we, we borrowed one of their little sailfish these little two men sailboats and and it's the end of October, upstate New York. Good water temperature then. And we head out into this lake, and it's pretty windy, so we're, we're like, whew, we're probably going 20 miles an hour, across, maybe more across this lake. Seemed pretty fast, especially when you're stoned. It's like we're, we're clipping across this lake, and we're doing great. We got the catch in the wind. This is amazing. There's, there's no brakes in the sailboat. I mean, there's no, there's nothing. There's nothing in the sailboat. And, and the shoreline with rocks and stuff is coming at us at a fast <laughs> clip, right? So my, my buddy says, we, we got to come about. Well, how do you do that? Well, I'm not sure. But we somehow we got to change the position of the sail, and it'll make us go, and then the rudder, and it'll make us go in a different way. Well, uh, that works very well if you know how to do that. <laughs> But that wind that has the power to push you at an amazing speed across that lake, that wind is unforgiving. And if you don't come about right and you don't set that sail right, what happened to me could happen to anyone. It hit us and turned us upside down. Sail straight, keel up, sail, sail straight down the water. And the water temperature is, I don't know, 45 degrees probably, 50 maybe. And we're shivering, hanging onto that boat. And they came and rescued us. And I think that God's grace is like that wind. The problem is, I don't know how to set the sail to catch it. I, nobody taught me. And I come to Alcoholics Anonymous and I get a sponsor and he has me start taking actions that I don't know is designed to position me in life to catch God's grace. And that's what A is about, I think, is to, is to teach me how to sail life. And I, you know, we have a resistance to this. I'll, I'll tell this story and I'll move on to step eight and nine. Uh, when I was a little kid, there was a, a TV show on that I used to watch frequently called Rescue Eight. And this one particular episode was, and Rescue 8 was about these paramedics that worked out of a firehouse. And they were called out, they're, they're always called out every episode on different situations where people are in distress. This particular episode, they, they're called out, and there's this little girl, and she's hysterical, and she's crying and evidently in some pain, and her arm is wedged up into a vending machine. Her mother and father standing there, very upset. Every time they've tried to pull the little girl's arm out of the vending machine, it seems to hurt her. And they, they eventually stopped, and, and, and they don't know what to do. And now the fire trucks are showing up, and the firemen are pulling these acetylene torches and electric saws off the truck. And they're talking about cutting the door out from around her arm, which is making her very upset, and the parents very upset. And the one paramedic's watching all this. And he walks over to the little girl and he kneels down and he says, Sweetheart, do you have something in your hand? <laughs> and she goes, uh, uh-huh. What do you got in your hand? She goes, uh, a candy bar. He says, would you let go? No, it's my candy bar. It's my gambling. It's my gossip. It's my anger. It's my porno. It's my, 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 my. She ain't letting go for the candy bar. And he, he doesn't know what to do, so he backs away. He backs away for about two minutes. He comes back over to her and he says, she, he says, sweetheart, she goes, what? And he says, I, I'm just here to make you a promise, that's all. What? He says, I want to promise you two brand new candy bars if you'll let go of that crumpled old one that's in your hand. And she said, really? And he said, I promise you. And because she trusts him, she lets go of the candy bar and her hand slides out of the vending machine. What's your candy bar? 
Chamberlain used to say it's a process of uncovering, discovering, and discarding. Uh, there was a guy, Cubby, who d died years ago. I, I don't know if any of you ever heard Cubby. Cubby was amazing. Cubby used to say that when you see through the illusion of value to the truth, that there is no value in this thing you're hanging on to, then transformation becomes possible. But as long as, until I discover the truth, I still, I'm, I've got a grip on that. And do I trust God enough that if I, if I gave up, if I really let go of my anger and let him take it, and he did, would I, could I trust him to defend me and take care of me? Would I know I'm going to be okay? Because if I don't know that and I'm not willing to trust God, I'm probably not going to let go of the thing that I use to, 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 to validate and secure and protect and gratify myself. Um, every defect of character has some little nugget of, of perceived value. It may be delusionary, but I don't hang on to things because I'm self-destructive, I hang on to things because I'm selfish. I'm me first. I'm a protect, secure, gratify, do for me person. That's why I hang on to stuff. And when I see the truth and start to realize that God's vision of Bob and God, my, God, Bob's life in God's hands is a lot better than Bob's life in Bob's hands. And that's been consistent. What would that be like if I could do that 24-7, 360 days a week, a year? It'd be amazing, wouldn't it? I just, the little, the little tiny bit I know about that is because I, I'm in the wheelbarrow intermittently enough to know for sure that God's vision of my life's better than mine. So, I would, I'd like to be able to do that more often, more consistently. It just it's it's so nice in the wheelbarrow that it's boring. Got to jump out every once in a while, stir things up. <laughs> well, step eight and nine were the most horrifying steps for me. I, I I on a couple occasions I would be at meetings and people were talking about amends and I I just felt hopeless. I felt like leaving AA. I remember what was it that. that the Thai club one time, and there was some, I don't know who, some knucklehead, self-righteous guy pounded the table and said, I paid back every single dime I've ever owed anybody. And I just sat there and thought, oh, no, you didn't. No, that's impossible. You couldn't have done that. And I started thinking about all the people I'd robbed and all the, the money I owed, and oh, my God, not even counting the thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars I owed my family but I, I, lived, I lived on the streets I did this probably at least once a day most days twice a day I stole and I stole other stuff too I went through I'd go walk the streets and steal stuff out of oh, if your car was unlocked I'd just take whatever's in there I was the guy at the bar that if you got up to go to the bathroom I'll steal your change, drink your drink, and change seats at the bar. I, I, every day, I, to support a, a, a terrible tobacco addiction, I, would, I looked like a mess. I had long hair down to about here and a beard, and I was dirty because I don't bathe. I'd go into a nice restaurant or a gas station or a bar, and I'd go up to the cigarette machine, and I'd pretend like I'm putting money in there and then go crazy banging on it making noise and making a scene until the manager would come out, open the door, and give me a pack of cigarettes. I did that lie at least once a day, maybe twice a day. I supported, pretty much supported a, a, a cigarette ha habit by stealing cigarettes. Or I stole out of grocery stores. I stole, uh, I was a shoplifter. At the end of my drinking, I couldn't shoplift because I was too shaky and too insecure, and I looked bad. I became the guy, the minute I walked into your store, you were on me. Right, you were on me because I looked like I looked like trouble. Uh, but you, I start, I hear people talking about paying back all the money. I, I thought in my mind, I thought, oh my God, if if I had got a really good job, 
and I gave every dime I made, I don't think I'll live long enough to pay all that back. Just the debt to my parents alone was, was astronomical. And I just, I felt hopeless, but I, I'm so glad that the people in AA didn't believe what I believed. They believed in the program, they believed in God's grace, and they believed that in Alcoholics Anonymous, what seems like the impossible, just takes a little longer, that's all. I remember the first, the first uh, the, the, one of the first amends I had to make was to the courts to about the two years in prison. And then around the same time, people in AA, my sponsor and some other people, start hounding me about making amends to my parents. Because they, 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 they're nosy. They, say, they ask you things like, so, where's your parents? Oh, they live in Pennsylvania. Oh, when's the last time you talked to them? Oh, it's been a couple years. Oh, so you haven't made amends to your parents yet. Well, it's not that. They just won't have anything to do with me. Well, we think you should start calling them. I said this. I said, listen, they won't take my calls. You know what they said? They said, don't call, collect. <laughs> I had never thought of that. That's, that's how selfish I am. That's how selfish I am. How, how much with, and egomaniacs with inferiority complexes have a sense of a sick sense of entitlement. Of course I'd make them pay for it. You know? I remember the first time I ever called. My mother answers the phone. Oh, God, when she heard my voice, she got upset. She, oh, God, what do you want? And then, then she says, oh, no. You're, you're, you're in Reading. You're back here again, aren't you? I said, no, Mom, I'm in Nevada. She said, you're in Nevada? Well, the operator didn't ask me to pay for the call. I said, no, I paid for the call. She went, you paid for the call? <laughs> it was like so out of character for me. She couldn't believe I paid for the call. And, and you guys had me send her stuff, and I, I, I could not miss a Mother's Day, Father's Day, birthday, anniversary, or Christmas. I decided to, I, when I my first got sober, I had these little minimal jobs. I mean, I, I didn't really make any money until I was sober over 10 years. I worked, I worked a lot for nothing, pretty much, for many, many years. And so I'm working $3 and something an hour, which was the minimum wage in those days. And, and, I, and I'm struggling I, just to get by, you know. And they want me to buy them something every time there's a holiday or something. And I remember the first Christmas. God, I'm broke. I got my mom a little thing, and I, I, my dad is the one I'm really behind with a lot. And the best I could do was I got him a necktie that I think it was like eight or nine bucks or something, you know. It was pathetic. I, I remember saying, I don't want to send this to him. This is pathetic. You know, I was so far behind with my dad. If I, got him, if I bought him a beach house and a new Bentley, we wouldn't even scratch the surface how far behind I am with my dad. And they said, send it. It's not, they said, you know, this cliche stuff. It's not, it's the thought that counts. And yeah, right. And I sent it. About a week or so later, I called back there. and They'd received the gifts. I'd been calling for quite a while. My dad would never talk to me. He wouldn't get on the phone. That's how much I heard him. After he received that gift, it was the first time he ever got on the phone. He could hardly talk to me. He'd been hurt, so I was his only son. I'd hurt him badly. But he got on the phone, and he, he, he's almost, his voice was breaking as he was thank, trying to thank me for sending him the tie. He said, it's a really nice tie. <laughs> See, I, it, I wouldn't have done it if it was up to me. And it was the beginning. When I was a year sober, uh, my mom and dad decide that they want to come out. I've been calling them and sending them stuff for a while. They're going to come out to in Las Vegas and eyeball me because they're, they're not, they don't trust me. Because I've been calling them so many times, so many times. And they uh, decide to come out to Vegas. And they came. Here's the attitude they have. It's a true story. You can, uh, they come out with this attitude that he's probably still a bum trying to con us. 
But, you know, we've never been to Vegas, so it's not a complete loss. And that's how they came out to Vegas. They stayed at the Stardust. My, uh, I met him at the airport. My, I took him out to dinner. My sponsor and his, his wife at Gladi at the time, we took him out to dinner. And uh, it was a really a nice, nice thing. And uh, uh, my sponsor said, uh, it was his idea, why don't you invite him to the, the Floating Big Book group, which was my home group. I didn't want to do that. I think... I think there was a part of me that was a little bit embarrassed that I had to go to AA to straighten my life up, you know? But my sponsor said, invite him, bring him to the, 